Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series that we launched in 2020 with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these SALT Talks, the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we're excited to resume in September of 2021 and welcome uh, our guests on SALT Talks today, We'll be speaking at that conference as well. But our goal is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. We're very excited today to welcome Jillian Tett to Salt Talks. Uh, Jillian today serves as the chair of the editorial board and editor at large US of the Financial Times. She writes weekly columns covering a range of economic, financial, political, and social issues. She's also the co-founder of FT's Moral Money, which is a twice-weekly newsletter that tracks the ESG revolution in business and finance, which has grown to be a staple Financial Times product. In 2020 and 2021, uh, Moral Money won the Cebu Best Newsletter Award as well. Uh, Jillian is the author of The Silo Effect, which looks at the global economy and financial system through the lens of cultural anthropology. She also authored Fool's Gold, which is a 2009 New York Times bestseller and financial book of the year at the inaugural Spears Book Awards. Her next book, her most recent book, is called Anthrovision, A New Way to See Life and Business, and it was released in June of 2021. Again, a fantastic book using Jillian's uh, PhD in anthropology, which not every business journalist has, and applying that lens uh, to the way we look at business, economics, and investing. Uh, Jillian has received honorary degrees from the University of Exeter, the University of Miami, St. Andrews, London University, Carnegie Mellon, Baruch, and an honorary doctorate from Lancaster University in the UK, in addition to that PhD from Cambridge uh, in cultural anthropology that I mentioned before. Uh, but hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm. Anthony has a couple of nice degrees, but not quite as many as Jillian. Uh, he also definitely doesn't have and, a PhD and in no, anthropology. And no honorary degrees. Okay, We're too politically toxic for an honorary degree in this woke place, John. Although They're trying to take also, away Anthony's degrees at this point rather than giving maybe, him new honorary yeah, exactly. degrees. 100%. Okay, but so far, Harvard still wants the donations, Jillian. So I'm um, okay. They're not quite that woke yet, but we'll discuss that on another so but I fun. think I think you have degrees from the school of life every, in every possible sense, and the school of political life too, Anthony. Yeah, well, yes, yeah, so an eleven-day PhD in Washington lunacy. But but Jillian, thank you so much for joining us. So again, another brilliant book. I've read two of your prior books: the one on uh, J.P. Morgan and Bear Stearns and the derivative markets uh, before the crash, well-timed book. The Silo Effect, which I thought was another brilliant assessment of how we're living in our own little echo chamber. And now you're taking your life's uh, work, a study of anthropology, your work as a journalist, and you're synthesizing it for us people. Um, and I, But before you get there, why did you decide to become a journalist and a writer? Where did you grow up? What was your inspiration for your life? Well, if I tell you that, it basically explains a bit why I wrote the book, because I am fundamentally completely weird by most people's standards, particularly by the standards of anyone working in finance and markets. You know, I spent the last 25 years as a financial journalist writing about finance, business, politics, tech, all the stuff that you've swum in all your life, Anthony. But I actually started my career as an anthropologist, someone dedicated to the study of human culture, working in a place called Soviet Tajikistan, that's just north of Afghanistan, looking at the practices, symbols, ceremonies, rituals, belief systems of people in Tajikistan. I look particularly at marriage rituals. And a lot of people would say, well, that's kind of really weird. Why would you go from that kind of cultural analysis, exotic stuff into writing about Wall Street? And essentially, I believe they're intimately connected. And that's really what I set out to do in the book. Well, I mean, they are they are connected, but expound as to why they are connected. They're connected because basically we are all human and humans everywhere in the world, whether they're on Wall Street, whether they're on a trading floor, whether they are in a C-suite or in the White House, or if they are in a Tajik village, we're all human social creatures. 
We operate according to all kinds of weird cultural practices that we absorb from our environment that always seem strange to everyone else, but natural to ourselves. We're all shaped by rituals and symbols and ceremonies. And we need to understand these cultural patterns and assumptions to work out what drives us. Because if we ignore them, if we think that we are all as logical and rational as robots, then we are liable to be constantly tripped up by nasty surprises. Well, you know, I think that's a brilliant part of the book. I'm just going to hold the book up for everybody because I like promoting the books of my friends. It's Anthrovision, A New Way to See in Business and Life. But I think it's an old way, actually. I think that's the most interesting thing about your book. When I read it, it's an old way to look at things. You're basically stripping off the technology. You're stripping off of the all the veneer that we put on ourselves today and looking at us from a historical perspective about how we behave with each other. Is that a fair assessment of the book? I think, Anthony, you put your finger on it. In some ways, it is a very old way. And it suggests that we modern, ultra-modern, sophisticated humans aren't that different from our ancestors or from people elsewhere in the world. But although that is in some ways incredibly obvious, it is amazing how often we forget it today, partly because anybody who's working in finance and markets and business has the illusion that they're operating in an ultra sophisticated world shaped by computers, shaped by rational expectations to use the economic framework that's tossed around so much in the markets. And also there's something really important, which is the rise of artificial intelligence, big data sets, and all the other computerized tools. And one of the core cool messages in my book is that tools like AI are incredibly important and incredibly useful. They really can revolutionize finance, revolutionize a lot of business processes. But the problem with these tools is that they assume that human beings are rational and consistent. They tend to work by gathering data from the recent past and extrapolating that into the future and assuming that somehow correlation is causation, which of course we all know it isn't. And they tend to ignore the context of all the models and all these big data sets. So what I'm really arguing in the book is a world that's being overrun by AI, artificial intelligence, needs another type of AI, anthropology intelligence, just to make sense of the context and the consequences and the cultural patterns that shape us all. So you mentioned rituals, and I want to I want to go there first before I dive into the book. And you've observed Wall Street and business and Western, Eastern business cultures. Tell me a Wall Street ritual. Let's say that you were Jane Goodall, and this was National Geographic, and you had the you had the binoculars on, and you were observing the Wall Street primates in their habitat. <laughs> and, uh, and I want you to channel Richard Attenborough and go ahead, tell me about those people. What are they like? Well, you know, a lot of people, when they think about Wall Street rituals, think about some of the more dramatic events like going to bars or banging things on trading floors or ringing the bell on the stock exchange. And those rituals matter. But one of the most important rituals is something that we've not been able to do for the last year and a half, which was the investment banking conference. And investment banking conferences are fascinating as rituals because in many ways they're very similar to the gigantic ceremonial events that were weddings in the Tajikistan location where I did my PhD research. What investment banking conferences do, like ritualistic weddings, is unite a scattered tribe of people, enable people to come together to reaffirm their social ties and not just recreate social ties, but also to share a common worldview. They kind of have rituals which essentially reflect their shared cult worldview and assumptions, and then reproduce it um, amongst that network. And if you look at the ceremonies and rituals that go with your average investment banking conference, including, I would imagine, something like the SALT event, you can really see that shared worldview and see both the perils and the promise of that shared worldview. And I used that kind of analysis back in 2005 with an investment banking conference. In fact, it was the European Securitization Forum Conference. Um, and I analyzed the conference. And what I saw then enabled me to predict the 2008 financial crisis. And, and you did that in your book, more or less, that first book that I read 
Uh, you explained that the derivatives were being layered on top of each other and that the full risk assessment was cloudy at best and that things were being rated AAA that perhaps were not being rated AAA, but it was a ritual, meaning there Absolutely. was a- I mean, you can sit there and say, well, listen, what went wrong with the 2008 financial crisis? You know, you can look at it in terms of capital flows and numbers and ratings and all that kind of stuff. Or you can say there was a fundamental human process going on. You had a group of bankers who were such a tight-knit tribe um, that they and were spoken language which no one else understood. No one outside the tribe understood what they were talking about when they talked about things like CDOs, and they didn't expect anyone else to understand. It gave them power controlling that language, a bit like the priests in the medieval Catholic church who spoke Latin and no one else did, and they expected the congregation just to sit there quietly and lap it up. Um, but also the vision they had of um, finance, their creation mythology, because every group has a creation mythology. The creation mythology essentially um, implied that they were doing this amazing thing with liquefaction, creating liquid markets that would, would be good for everyone. But they couldn't see the contradictions in their creation mythology. And there were fundamental contradictions there, um, like the fact that the products they were creating were supposed to be making markets more liquid, but actually were so complex that no one could trade them. Um, they couldn't see those contradictions precisely because they were in such a ghetto or a silo. And also, none of the PowerPoints in their ritualistic events had any faces or people. They'd kind of written people, the end user, out of their financial creations. And that reflected a mentality that was absolutely beset with tunnel vision and had no sense of the consequences of what was happening in terms of risk taking. And there's a wonderful scene in, in the book, uh, Michael Lewis's book, The Big Short, in the movie, where the hedge fund traders go down and meet a lap dancer in Florida who's actually taken out subprime mortgages. You're nodding, Anthony, because you probably see the, remember that scene. I do and remember that scene. It was one of the better scenes in the book. And I read the book 12 years ago, but continue. Well, when, when the hedge fund traders met that, um, I think it was a pole dancer or a lap dancer, they yeah, realized- it was, at, it was at Rachel's, John, just so you know, but not that I read <laughs> the book or anything. Okay, keep going. Yeah, well, when they met her, they basically said, wow, subprime mortgages are being used like that. This is a kind of shock. This is kind of nuts. And the thing that was nuts was not the fact that the hedge fund traders realized it. It was a fact that no one else did because they were so beset with tunnel vision. So basically, my book is simply a call for us to bust out of our tunnel vision, get a sense of lateral vision, look at the wider world like an anthropologist, to really get out and meet some real life people, look at the rituals and cultural patterns we normally ignore, because that's the only way to guard against risk properly and to get savvy about what could be about to hit us in financial markets or anything else. Listen, I think it's I think it's a brilliant assessment of, of what is going on. You also mentioned in the book that data is effectively the new oil. It has become this very valuable commodity on planet Earth. It's manipulated by people like Oxford Analytica. It's used for forces of good, but also for forces of evil. Tell us about uh, what you write about oil being, sorry, uh, data being the new oil. Well, I think the data is incredibly important. So I do tell the story of, it's actually Cambridge Analytica, not Oxford Analytica, but hey, it's all posh English colleges. I, I meant to say Cambridge, geez, Oxford <laughs> Analytica. And my apologies to Oxford Analytica. I'm sorry, but I meant to say Cambridge. Look, Cambridge, um, Oxford. You know, you know, the great thing about me, Jillian, is because I'm from, I'm an Italian kid from Long Island. Nobody cares, okay? <laughs> I don't even bother pronouncing the names right because no one assumes I'm going to pronounce them right anyway. I leave that well, up to John go. Darcy to figure out. Well, funnily enough, the reason why the data company was called Cambridge Analytica was precisely because the name Cambridge sounds kind of, you know, very auspicious and, you know, got a lot of credibility for an American audience. Um, you know, strangely enough, someone else tried to copy Cambridge Analytica, the data company, and they based it in the city of Oxford um, down in Mississippi to try and create the same aura. So your mistake, Anthony, was exactly the same kind of idea that they were trying to capture in the marketing but um, Cambridge Analytica um, was one of the breed of tech companies that arose starting from about 2012 to use data 
to predict the future by hoovering up enormous amounts of information about what we're doing in cyberspace and, and not just predict the future, to also try and manipulate people by sending out targeted messages. In some ways, no different from advertising, but what Cambridge Analytica did was to apply these tools into the political space, creating some incredible controversy in the 2016 election, as you know, Anthony. And one of the things I argue in this book is that what's happening in this world of data is incredibly important, not just in political terms, but also in economic terms, because this type of activity does not easily fit into any economist models, nor into investors' models when they're trying to value companies. And the reason is really simple. Money is not involved. Money is not involved. And economists are trained to think about everything in terms of money. Um, it's one of the big shortfalls of the whole profession that they can't count things unless it's expressed in monetary forms. And the problem with data is actually what's going on is a barter trade in the sense that every day in cyberspace, we're giving up information in exchange for getting back services like Gmail or your Google Maps or anything like that. And we normally express this in terms of a negative, i.e. it's free, there's no money involved. But I argue in the book, you do better off to use a concept that's very common in anthropology, which is barter, which is basically what's going on. And so we need to start counting the barter trade. We need to start recognizing it because if nothing else, if you don't start talking openly about barter, you have no hopes of building a tech sector that feels more ethical to consumers. Yeah, listen, I think I think it's 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 well said, and I'm going to now synthesize one of your last books with this book, The Silo Effect, about how we tunnel into our own confirmed biases and we live in our little news silo, our cultural, ec ecocentric, if you will, uh, silo. Our ec ec you know our ecosystem is quite narrow, despite globalization. And one of the weird things. In my observation, your last book, I was like, wow, we're becoming more globalized, a result of which it makes many people fearful and they retrench into a silo. And in this book, what, what I love is that you basically now are explaining because of that, we get a lot of fear related to information, conspiracy theory, disinformation, fake news. Uh, and this manifested itself with the COVID-19 pandemic and the tragedy of that. So tell us a little bit about your observation of how our society in mass, the global society, and us as individuals handled the tragedy of COVID-19. Well, in many ways, I know my book, Anthrovision, tries to provide some answers to the questions I raised in the book, The Silo Effect, because The Silo Effect said that we're all incredibly prone to silos. We're all retreating into tunnel vision and tribes. And Anthrovision says, well, yes, there's a way to bust out of it and it's to actually act and think more like an anthropologist and to try and get a sense of lateral vision, to try and look at the entire picture. And above all else, what I'm calling for in this book is an effort to try and think yourself into the minds and lives of people who seem different from you, not just so that you can empathize with other people, but that you can also flip the lens and look back at yourself with more clarity. Because there's a wonderful Chinese proverb, which is that a fish can't see water. We can never see ourselves clearly unless we actually make an effort to jump out of our fishbowl, go and swim with other fish for a bit, or even ask the other fish what they think about our fishbowl, and then look back. So it's a kind of win-win having the anthropology mindset. You both understand others better and you understand yourself. And that sounds really abstract, but let me just give you two examples of how this would have played out in the pandemic if we had more policymakers who thought like anthropologists. Firstly, we would not have ignored what was happening on the other side of the world in a strange, weird place called Wuhan, because guess what? Most people did ignore that. It seemed a long way away, and they just turned their eyes away from it. Uh, most people thought, you know, like Donald Trump when he said, that African countries were, quote, shitholes. People went, oh, that's horrible, that's terrible. But actually, most of us kind of had the same instinct to shy away from places like Africa when they've had epidemics, rather than feel empathy to try and understand what's going on. So a bit of em empathy for other experiences would have helped us a lot to understand what to expect with COVID. 
it would have also sh shown us some of the possible solutions for how to respond. You know, there's a lot of anthropologists who've studied mask culture, the use of face masks in Asia in relation to the Asian pandemics, and made the point that the reason why masks are useful is not just because of medical science, having that fabric stopping the viruses, it's also useful because of behavioral impacts. You know, a mask is a very powerful psychological prompt and ritual you can actually use each day to remind yourself to change your behavior. And it also has a powerful cultural signaling aspect that if you put a mask on, you signal that you're being respectful to other people and thinking about the wider good. So we could have learned all that beforehand if we'd bothered to get some empathy. But also, if people had looked at America with outsider eyes before 2020 and asked whether America was ready to cope with a pandemic or not, they would have seen all of these holes and problems in the healthcare system. And just to cite one tiny example, the problems in having federal structures run, th run some things, but local structures run another, and they're just not joined up at all. Listen, I think I think it's excellent, but there's a core message that you have in this book is that we have intellectual superiority complexes and we don't listen to people. You tell this great story about uh, Paul Odolini, who was the chief executive of Intel, where anthropologists were brought in to try to shake the minds of the engineers. And you write in the book that... Uh, they were dismissed, ignored, or derided, uh, and most the mindset uh, of the highly trained engineers and executives tended to assume that everyone did or should, and I think that's the operative. They did or should think like them, and I think well, when I read, when I go chapter by chapter, it's where a bunch of blockheads walled off from each other is basically what the message is: break the walls down. Am I am I getting the right? Just a bit. Yeah, I mean, another easy way to say it, Anthony, is to invoke a principle which is fundamental to American political structures, and I know that you hold very dear, which is checks and balances. No question. And it saved, Most, the, saved the civilization, saved the democracy, actually, and probably saved people's lives uh, at the end of the day. Listen, the checks and balances in America's great political system are absolutely something which is fundamental. Checks and balances should be part of anybody's thinking at work on the trading floor, in business, in the C-suite. And what I mean by that is we all have a tendency to assume that the way that we think is natural and inevitable and how everyone should think if they don't already think that way. It's just part of being human, just like being angry is being part of human. But we don't think that actually just succumbing to anger is a good thing. We realize we have to get over it. And so we have to get over this idea that is, we can assume that everyone else thinks the way that we can. And in a company like Intel, where I cite the Intel engineers who actually brought in an anthropologist to help them, it was kind of a shock for the 25-year-old Silicon Valley, Valley geeks to realize that the rest of the world didn't think like they do when it came to products. And that actually, if you're trying to de design a device or gadget that might work for an, you know, an 80-year-old Indian grandmother, you cannot have the same assumptions that you have when your product design is sitting in Silicon Valley. But that same point is played out over and over again in business. And the simple message of anthropology is, if you have checks and balances, if you have a diversity of views inside a structural office, if you have ways of exposing yourself to the minds of others, if you simply have you know, a way of getting some common sense into your thinking, and by that I mean a common view of people who are not exactly like you, you will have a better chance of managing risks and also um, you know, seeing new opportunities. And that's as true in the financial world as it is in tech sector, Silicon Valley, or anywhere else. Before I turn it over to my erstwhile co-host, who I was told earlier today should have his own show, John Darcy, that's what I was told. Okay, it was like it was like stabbing me in the chest. Uh, I know you spoke I do, to my mom earlier because I don't but, know. Who no, no, but I begrudgingly that. agreed with your fan. I said yes. He's extremely talented and he deserves his own show. Before I turn it over to John Darcy, I want to go to Bigley, which is a chapter in the book 
about understanding Donald Trump. And, and there's some brilliant insights there. Uh, one of them is uh, Mr. Trump's language, the use of his language and the appeal of it. And then secondarily, obviously, this whole silo effect where people have these reinforced biases that Mr. Trump uh, very adeptly preyed upon. And so I want you to comment on that before I turn it over to the new television star. <laughs> well, I should congratulate you, Anthony, for getting through a whole 20 minutes of conversation without mentioning the T word, Donald Trump. Well, um, I, I couldn't avoid it, actually, because it was, it was such an important, I thought, a, par- a chapter in your book. Yep, I do have a chapter all about Bigley and Trump. And actually, I should stress that the chapter actually is not just about Trump, it's actually about journalists and myself. Because one of the things I should say upfront and stress is that journalists are as prone to tunnel vision and tribalism as yes, anybody you else. That out. You do point out that a lot of journalists miss the appeal of him. Um, yep. But I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I thought that was another brilliant assessment. Well, I would put myself in that category. Hey, I'm human too. I'm like everybody else. I can't always see the water in which I swim swim in as a journalistic fish. We're all shaped by cultural assumptions and biases, myself included. And one of the things I think fascinating about journalists is that I tell the story that when Donald Trump said the word bigly during the 2016 campaign debates, um, all the journalists I knew instinctively laughed. And because we found it funny. And that's kind of like, okay, so we found it funny. But the question to ask is, why do we find it funny? And in that moment of laughter, we basically all collectively portrayed the fact that we had this inbuilt arrogance and assumption that the only people in America who have the right to have power are those who have command of words and language. Um, There's, you know, one of the few acceptable forms of snobbery in America has been around having command of words and education. And that is so baked into us as journalists because guess what? We swim in words every day, that's our craft. That we kind of assume that everyone else thinks like us. Well, newsflash, they don't. The story of 2016 is actually, there's a lot of people who resent the arrogance and elitism of the educated people who control words. And the type of communication style that Donald Trump was using was very much based on nonverbal forms of communication as much as anything else. Um, I tell the story in the book that I went along on the advice of a friend to see a wrestling match. And of course, Donald Trump had originally become well known to many television viewers in America, not through The Apprentice, but through wrestling. And until you've experienced a wrestling match and seen how visceral and nonverbal the communication is, you see the stage managed aggression and conflict and the name calling which is so similar to kind of crooked hillary or little mark rubio and the chanting and the fact that the audience you know takes what is happening seriously but not literally until you've seen that you don't realize that that was a performative style that donald trump borrowed lock sock and barrel for his own political campaigns it worked really well because it connected very deeply with a lot of voters and the key point is this most educated elites didn't even realize that was going on because they were in their own fishbowl and had never been to a wrestling match. So frankly, journalists, like everyone else, need to jump out their fishbowls, go and see the world more widely. And frankly, we all need to show a bit more humility to recognizing that our way of looking at the world and thinking is not the only way. I, I, you listen, I think it was brilliant. And of course, I also fell prey to it when he was attacking me, I called him the fattest president since William Howard Taft, Jillian, okay? And that knocked me off of Twitter for 12 hours, okay? And that wasn't even inspired by you, John Darcy. That was my own editorial commenting. So I'm going to turn it over to you now. Go ahead, yeah. Mr. Darcy. Yeah, I can't take credit for that one, but but you did get put on Twitter suspension. I remember that. That was uh, interesting times. But um, Jillian, thanks so much for joining us. I'm always fascinated by your work and um, you talk a lot about human nature. Obviously, the study of anthropology is about human nature and social constructs. And our world has obviously been changed by the internet and by the advent of social media. I'm curious your view on how much uh, of social media and sort of the echo chambers that we find there are a reflection of our human nature. They just found a new outlet uh, for which to, to create these silos or these echo chambers. And how much have we been changed? How, how much has our society been changed by the internet by social media, which you know a lot of people like to refer as as anti-social media, where human interaction, especially during the pandemic, has waned. How has it changed us, or is it merely just a reflection of the ingrained DNA that we always experience? 
Well, John, I think that's such a fantastic question. And what I think has happened is this. When the internet was started and social media was started, it held out the promise of connecting us all and breaking down silos and giving everyone access to everyone else and information. But what actually happened was that when we, when we went online, we had such in, information overload that we automatically started re-congregating in silos and tribes just to manage this information overload. And there's something very important about the internet, which is that it creates the ability to customize our individual experiences. Um, you know, we really live in the world of Generation C, generation customization, where we don't just think that the world revolves around us, that we're the center of the world, not that we're fitting into the world, but increasingly that we can customize the world using these digital tools. I mean, you know, you go back 50 years ago or so when people like, you know, myself or Anthony were growing up and we had vinyl records or cassettes of music, which was pre-selected by someone else. Today's kids want their own playlist. And the same is true about how we get information online and how we present our identities. You know, we customize it all the time. And the more we do that, the more we tend to not just reflect the tribalism we have in the real world, we actually intensify it. And we go down these rabbit holes of customized information and customized identity and customized tribalism. And in many ways, the internet, sorry, the COVID-19 lockdown has made it worse because not only have we been physically trapped in small spaces, we've been trapped with people who are just like us, i.e. our social pod or family. We haven't been colliding with different people every five minutes on the street or out and, out and about. And also many of us have actually been more trapped mentally in cyberspace too as a result. And one of the other great messages I really want to stress is after COVID, we need to seize every opportunity we possibly can to bust out of our fish bowls, out of our ghettos, out of our rabbit holes, and go out and encounter the real world and other people who are not like us. Right. And, and I think COVID-19 in a number of ways was a, was a manifestation of you know, people's ingrained biases and, and the echo chambers that they tend to live in or the silos they tend to live in. And, and you write about you know, the pandemic in the book, and you and Anthony talked about it briefly earlier, but in your view, why is there still such a divide? And it's almost a political divide between mask wearing, between vaccines, and, and then on the other side, the vaccine hesitant and people that even at the height of the pandemic viewed wearing a mask as, as sort of insulting to their own dignity that they would be forced to or asked to wear a mask. Why is there such a divide there? And what does that tell us about human nature? Well, it's partly an issue of misinformation. As Anthony said, there's been tremendous amount of echo chambers and misinformation often deliberately planted. Um, it's partly a question of political tribalism and symbols. I mean, for a long period of time, mask wearing became a symbol of your political allegiance. Um, and that is just tragic. Um, and it's partly because there simply aren't a lot of outlets to enable people to collide with each other and the unexpected. Um, and this is really alarming. And we're seeing the very tangible implications and impacts of it. And one of the things that we've learned in COVID is that we are all interconnected. We're all exposed to each other, um, but we don't understand each other. And that's very dangerous. Right. You talked about investment conferences. Obviously, we run a big one, the SALT conference. There's all kinds of other rituals and constructs that exist in the financial system, uh, in the financial industry that are being heavily disrupted by technology, fintech. Uh, you know, I listened to a recent podcast with Mark Andreessen from A16Z. He was making the analogy of, of blacksmiths. You know, we used to get around on horses. The blacksmith put uh, horseshoes on horses. They were an integral part of our society. As soon as the automobile was invented, those people either lost a significant portion of their income, lost their jobs, had to reinvent themselves. How much of that do you foresee in the financial industry? We obviously have things like crypto, digital assets, blockchain that are uh, you know, reducing the number of intermediaries we need for certain financial transactions and elements of the economy. How much of the financial system do you think is just going to shrink and people are going to have to adapt to the times? And, and what does that do uh, to sort of the psychology of our society? Well, I think the financial industry is indeed going, undergoing quite a big shakeup and change. And ironically, back in 2008, everyone thought the financial crisis was going to be this massive shakeout moment. 
Um, and it shook things up for a bit, but not dramatically. In some ways, the rapid rise of digitization, which has been accelerated during the COVID-19 pandemic, in many ways may end up being more important than 2008 for the shakeout process. So what you are seeing right now is that a number of intermediary jobs are being knocked out. You are seeing rising use of digitization and AI and other forms of robo finance um, coming into the markets. Um, you're not seeing a complete dash online into digital. I mean, one of the other parts of my book talks about the fact that, you know, offices don't exist just because they bring people together to clearly de delineated tasks. They're also very important as social spaces. Um, and it's a great irony that anthropologists have studied that although financial traders have had, have had the ability to trade from home on a Bloomberg terminal since the year 2000, in reality, banks have built bigger and bigger trading floors, physical trading floors, because they know there's merit in people being in the office together and interacting. And it's no surprise that um, banks like JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley and others are all saying that their employees need to come back into the office face to face now because they know there's value in us as human creatures being together and interacting in non-verbal non ways. But, um, you know, in spite of all that, I think the other great shakeup in finance right now, which, um, it, you know, is in some ways driving so much of the cryptocurrency world, is a shift in patterns of trust away from institutional trust and trust in people, trust in institutions and leaders into trust in the peer group, the crowd and trust in technology. And that's really at the heart of a lot of the rise of Ether, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies right now. And that's also incredibly important. And also, frankly, best understood from an anthropological perspective rather than an economist perspective. Right. Another key message of my book is if you want to understand how money works, don't treat it like a branch of Newtonian physics. I mean, as Richard Feynman once said, the great physicist, you know, if atoms could talk to each other, we couldn't do physics. You know, the reality is that traders and finances talk to each other. You can't treat it like a branch of Newtonian physics. You have to look at how social science and social patterns interact with economics and finance. Yeah. And your compatriot, Neil Ferguson, has written a lot about this, the history of money. And there's a lot of great writings, you know, about Bitcoin. I think bullish cases for Bitcoin about just the evolution of what money has been historically. You know, uh, as a uh, as a species, we've always collected trinkets and rocks and precious metals and and totems and things like that to represent and store value. So if you look at Bitcoin or, or cryptocurrencies as just uh, the, the latest evolution of that, uh, that's tailored for an internet age and a digital age, then it's not so ridiculous. But Bitcoin is such a polarizing topic and cryptocurrencies are such a polarizing topic. You see a certain group of people that are very obstinate and very resistant to the idea that this is a legitimate asset class and a legitimate part of the future. And you see other people that are so rabidly uh, bullish on Bitcoin that it sort of defies uh, any level of logic. Why do you think uh, you know those two camps exist, and and who are those two groups of people, and what shapes their view of cryptocurrency? Well, it's partly a question of whether you think that digitization and technology is good and trustworthy or not, and that's just something which divides people. But it's also, frankly, about power, and it's very important to recognize that the current system we have is based on trust in institutions as much as anything else. It's based on trust in central banks and to a lesser extent, trust in private sector banks as well. And it's really based on a vertical axis of trust, which is what underpins most of our current society. Um, but there's always been another axis of trust, which is a horizontal axis of trust. You can trust in the crowd, trust in your peer group. And that used to just operate on a very small scale in small face-to-face -face communities where everyone could kind of eyeball everyone else and trust each other. Um, but digitization has brought around ways of building trust across large groups in terms of trusting either in online peer reviews and rating systems. And that's what drives things like Uber or Airbnb. You know, you get in a stranger's car because you trust that the crowd has rated this person. Um, or you have trust in collective com computing technology. And that's really what is driving a lot of cryptocurrency at the moment. Um, so you have this clash between, you know, institutional trust and peer group trust, or if you like to use Neil Ferguson's metaphor between a tower or the type of towers that used to dominate medieval European cities or squares, kind of squares where crowds would congregate. 
And it's a inevitable aspect of human nature that people who benefit from institutional trust, who wield it, control it, shape it, never like being challenged by crowds um, or by you know horizontal trust, because guess what? They're going to lose power. So that's part of what's going on at the moment as well, I think. Yeah, that's fantastic. Last question I want to ask you, and it's about anxiety, a feeling of anxiety that feels to be gripping the world right now. And and I'm curious whether that's something that, you know, as someone who's living in the present day, we feel that anxiety and assign a higher value to it than anxiety that has existed throughout uh, civilization. You know, there's anxiety about the levels of debt we have on a national level and a household level about you know, central banking and all the money they're pumping into the system, what implications that has for the future, the rise of technology, the implications of that on, you know, our dignity as workers, whether we're going to be displaced by machines, and also about things like, you know, terrorism and advanced weaponry, and what does that mean for our world? Is that something that throughout history, there's been these levels of anxiety about change and about technological growth? Or is it something that today, based on your studies, it feels like it's above and beyond what it's been historically? Well, I think that's such a great question, John. I think the issue is this, that, um, you know, profound uncertainty has beset every community in history. The difference today is that we think that because we have these wonderful computers and modeling techniques, um, that we have the ability to somehow master the future, master time, predict what's going to happen. And, you know, in many ways, that is exactly what is, has happened in the last few decades. You know, we are, collectively have developed these fantastic intellectual tools like economic models, big data sets, um, like corporate balance sheets, medical science, all of which tries to, you know, not merely help us navigate where we're going right now, but predict the future too. And we put trust in these tools over and over again. And what we realized in the last, you know, decade, ever since 2008, is they're not perfect. They break down. The world is a lot more uncertain than people expect. We are prone to what the U.S. military calls VUCA, standing for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And one of the other messages of my book is that if you rely just on those tools like economic models, big data sets, or corporate balance sheets to navigate the world with, without recognizing the wider context and and consequences and culture, you're like somebody walking through a dark wood with a compass. You know, your compass can be brilliant at navigating. You don't want to throw your compass away. But if you just walk through that wood and look down at your compass all the time, staring at the dial and never lift your eyes, you will trip over a tree root or walk into a tree. And so an appeal for anthrovision is really an appeal for people to look up, look around, see the context and the culture in which they're operating, in which they create those tools and to see the consequences of what they're doing, to get lateral vision instead of the kind of tunnel vision that has so marred so many of us in recent years. Well, that's very comforting for my anxiety that humanity is still going to play a role in our world, uh, despite AI, despite the growth of big data, despite uh, all this technological innovation we're seeing around us. So Jillian, thank you so much uh, for joining us today on Salt Talks. Anthony, hold up her book one more time. It's called Anthrovision, A New Way to See Business, uh, to See in oh, Business another, and Life. It's another brilliant book and a great assessment of what's going on in our world. Jillian, thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll see you at the SALT Conference in a few months. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you both very much her. indeed for your interest. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you, Jillian. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to today's SALT Talk with Jillian Tett of the FT. Fantastic newsletter. I can't uh, recommend highly enough. Moral Money uh, that's published twice a week. Uh, that that Jillian leads that team over at the Financial Times. But uh, just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk or any of our previous SALT talks, you can access them on our website at salt.org backslash talks on demand, as well as on our YouTube channel, which is called Salt Tube. Uh, We're also on social media at Salt Conference is where we're most active. We live tweet all these episodes and broadcast them there. So please follow us on Twitter. We're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook as well. And please spread the word about these SALT talks. We love featuring great authors, uh, and and we think Anthrovision is a book that has to be on your must-read list for 2021. But on behalf of Anthony and the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy signing off from SALT Talks for today. We hope to see you back here again soon.